I want to start out today just talking about poems in general, how poems are related to, uh, to games. And as far as I'm concerned, when I write a poem and when I think about a poem, a poem is a, uh, a, poem is a game. Uh, it's played by one person. And the thing about uh, all games is that without rules, the games are just not fun. If you just get out there and run around on the field, that's just not fun. And if, you, if, there's, if, there's, no, if, if there's no constraints on what you're doing, then there's no way for you to really rise to the level of your excellence and really show what you can do. So that's how it works in poetry also, that uh, without rules, it's no fun. And Robert Frost said about uh, writing poetry that, for him, meter was important. And he said, if you write free verse, it's like playing tennis without a net. And uh, that's the idea. The thing about rules is that it doesn't really matter who sets them. Rules are just, they're just conventions. Somebody makes them up, and it doesn't matter who makes it up or whether you make it up or whether you change. If we all agree upon the rules, then that's, the, that's, that's uh, all that matters. In poetry, the rules are called form, and there are a lot of different uh, examples uh, of those rules in, in poetry. And I want to make a distinction between two types of uh, form in poetry or rules in poetry. One I would call inherited, and one I would call created. An inherited form is basically a form that has already existed uh, based on somebody else inventing it or creating it. And a lot of poets work within those inherited forms. Some of those are things like the haiku or the gazel or the sestina or the villanelle, the limerick or the sonnet. Uh, if you write in meter, that's a kind of rule. That's a kind of form. If you write in rhyme, that's a kind of form. If you have a certain rhyme scheme, that's a kind of form. And those things go way back in history from the very beginning of, of writing, uh, and there, there are a lot of them. And a lot of creative writing teachers have students work within those forms uh, to, to, to see how well they're able to, to handle uh, those, those older forms. William Blake, a poet that I really like, said, I must create my own system or be enslaved by another man's. Now, I think that's a really neat idea. I must create my own system or be enslaved by another man. So Blake's not saying get rid of systems or get rid of rules or get rid of form. He's saying, well, you have to have some kind of system. You have to have some kind of rule. You have to have some kind of form. But why do I have to take yours? Why can't I just make my own? And I agree with William Blake. So that's what I try to do in my poems. Now, the nature of form is that it's arbitrary. It doesn't make any difference what kind of form you invent as long as you invent some kind of form. And I'll talk about why, why form is important. But it's arbitrary, and that means it's senseless. There's no reason why there has to be any kind of form in poetry. But every once in a while, every once in a while, <coughs> some poets, and, and uh, among the really great poets, form does make sense. So let me give an example of a famous 20th century uh, poem called The Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. Uh, this is it. Uh, most students, when they first read it, can't stand it. Uh, and it it's, it's, seems like an odd poem. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rain water beside the white chickens. That's the poem. That's the whole poem. Now, when Tony Barnstone was here last year, he talked about how the stanza looks like a wheelbarrow in which one line is longer than the other and the other line is shorter and you can kind of you know see it kind of moving with uh, with the wheel and and maybe there's something to that but let me show you what other kind of form there is in this poem the first line in every stanza is made of three words so much depends a red wheel now think about that one a red wheel it's not really a red wheel because the line is a red wheelbarrow and a wheelbarrow is really one word, but he splits it, no hyphen or anything. So three, lo three words there, glazed with rain. And again, it's not really rain, it's rainwater. And then beside the white chicken. So three words in each of those uh, first lines. And then in the next line, uh, one word with two syllables. Upon, barrow, not really a word, part of wheelbarrow, right? Water and chickens. So that's a kind of form. 
It doesn't make any sense. There's no reason except for the long and short lines maybe to make it look like a wheelbarrow. But in terms of the number of words or the number of syllables, he didn't really have to do that. Um, and in addition to that, there are all these other things that are happening in this poem. Like in that first two lines, there are two U's. And there aren't really U's in the rest of the poem. And then in the next stanza, there are three E's. And then in the next stanza, there are three A's. And then in the last stanza, there are three I's. Now, that can't be accidental. So he is playing around with something. It certainly meant something for him. It doesn't mean much for me. But what, it, what, what works for me is that he made this poem, and I like the poem, so however he got to it, that's the key, right? But these are things that he set up for himself. So there is form in this poem, but it's arbitrary. It's invented by William Carlos Williams. So here's another famous poem in the 20th century called The Road Not Taken, about two words, roads diverge in the yellow wood. And uh, I'm <clears throat> sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. And then took the other, as just as fair, having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on the way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. <clears throat> Excuse me, two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. It's a very famous poem about choices in life and options that you have and, you know, which should you take? Should you follow, you know, where everybody goes? You carve your own path and take the road less, less traveled? Of course, he says they were equally, there's no real difference between the two. And he says it's made all the difference, but we don't even know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, it could be a bad thing. It made all the difference, you know. My life is a disaster because I chose that path or maybe everything worked out great. But what about the form in the poem? Well, it's very odd because almost no poet ever writes a stanza with five lines. In fact, I looked through all the collected works of Robert Frost, and I could only find two poems that had five lines, and this being one of them. Now, most times poets write, they work with uh, stanzas, groups of uh, lines that are four lines called a quatrain. Sometimes six, four, six, that's usual, eight, that, that kind of thing. But five, very unusual unless you're writing a limerick. And it's, it's basically five lines, you go, oh, there must be a limerick. Okay. So why did he do this? Why did he create a five-line stanza for this particular poem? Because if you have five lines, then you have an unequal apportionment of the rhyme. In other words, if you're going to have five lines, you're going to have rhyme in it, you're going to have... Uh, uh, some lines rhyme and some other lines rhyme, A rhymes and B rhymes, then you're going to have to have two of one and three of the other, or four and one. But you can't have two and two like in a quatrain. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay. All right. So, the poem rhymes A, B, A. So, would, both, stood. And then you expect it to go rhyme with both because normally poems in English rhyme A, B, A, B. Sometimes they rhyme A, B, B, A, but mostly it's A, B, A, B. So he kind of fools you. So you have would, both, stood, and then you have could. And then you have growth at the end. So the rhyme is uh, A, B, A, A, B, and that's very unusual. So what's happening in it? Well, he chooses this rhyme for each stanza, and he ends the stanza, and what you end with is important. Uh, he ends the stanza with the B rhyme, right? It's A, B, two choices, and then A, A, and then at the end, B. He goes in the, in the opposite direction, the wrong direction. So the poem is about choosing the less traveled road, and the rhyme is about choosing the less traveled rhyme, because it ends with the less, you know, the rhyme that's unexpected, okay? So... The rhymes become these two roads, and in that way, the form illustrates the content. Sometimes that happens. It doesn't always happen, but sometimes it happens.